This is American Family Education. I hope you got the idea. This is not just for the children. When I knew that I wanted to be able to help affect people's lives so that they could live their mission, it's really quick you start running into all of the reasons why maybe that mom can't adjust her life to be more mission driven, right? And some of the big things are, I have all these little people and they are struggling or they're making do or I can't problem solve all the things they bring home, right? And so it was really quick to say, well, how about we start with the children and have a place for them to be able to bring home and invite parents into really good culture and a really good mindset with content that matches in with who they're becoming and the things that align with truth, right? And process that allows them to have a growth mindset and be able to continue to go. So that's where we started and it's expanded to some really fun things. This opportunity right now, um, in the world, can you agree that most people don't learn like the skills and habits it takes to just really be successful? Can we all just like, is that like a baseline? We're all agreeing with that? Mm -hmm. Most, you know, high school graduates can't just say, now I can be fully independent and have joy and make a difference in the world, right? Like, we're not finding that. And even the ones that are graduating from college are coming out saying, okay, I didn't really find myself. I found a lot of expectations for me, but they didn't really find like their own purpose. Um, or they've completely lost who they are, right, as they're being bombarded with so many different things. Um, families are being compartmentalized to the point of disconnection. Has anybody ever heard a teenager say, Mom, you just don't get it. You know, you can't help me with this. Well, I'm hearing it from, like, first graders are coming home and telling their parents, you don't get it. Like, the teacher does it different. You can't help me with this. Big, huge red flag, run. Like, that's the wrong environment for your child if at a really young age they're saying, like, no. Um, the elements of real community are being lost. How is the family happy? We work together, we have goals together, we know each other, we like play, all of those really great things that make a great family, those are getting lost. Those are coming out of the culture and it's shifting into things that are not working really well, right, for our society. So that's our opportunity. Um, we have some symptoms where, I don't know about you, is anybody like me and they walk around and ask everybody what their mission and purpose in life is? No? <laughs> Come on, guys, it's super fun. Like, in the grocery store, on a bus, like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, if you could do anything, like, what would you do? It's so amazing, but it's amazing because I've kind of cheated, right? And I get to surround myself with you guys. Before I had this community to help my heart, like, heal and know that, okay, there's other people that want really great things for their life and their families. Most people I talk to outside, do you think they have an answer for that question? They don't know what their mission is. They're just getting by and they're just trying to cope with stuff. And that's not as fun as it could be, right? All right, so another one, people have a predominantly getting by focus instead of seeking joy and meaning. When people are choosing what to do with their time, what kind of things are people choosing to do? Yeah, like I've been there. Like this is not a judgment thing. This is like I've totally been there, but I've been on the other side now. And it just doesn't taste as good to just suck up your day until you're tired enough to go to sleep, right? So that's that. And then lack of leadership in our community has allowed for large corporations, banks, and government have increased in power and influence. Is anybody like me and kind of aware that some of this stuff is going on? Who do we really want making all the big decisions that affect what your child eats for lunch, right? Like, it's kind of ridiculous, right, how much influence is going into some of these decisions that Parents generations ago would have thought you were crazy if you said, oh, I wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be able to say a prayer in school. Generations ago, they would have thought, what in the world are you thinking that you'd allow your child in a place where they make rules like that? We just think that we need to really build up leadership. Okay, education and training for all areas of life by mentors who live what they teach. That's a huge deal. I expect that of myself, that I'm consistently learning and studying new things and being excited. And if I'm not excited about what I'm teaching and I don't feel like this is the very best thing for that student, there's no reason why I would ever teach that, right? There's no reason why I'd focus on it. So that's the culture here. So these kids get a chance to see these people who are super excited. And when teenagers see the adults super excited, they start to like chill a little bit and play and be excited about what they're doing, which is so important. Let's see, regular goals planning and mentoring led by trained leaders to encourage personal development. It's really not about clocking in. It's very much about we start the pattern of progression and being able to give that ownership to the students as they mature and as they're able to handle understanding that 
they can set a goal for a day, they can set a goal for a month, right? But this is a pattern that they can create in their lives so that they can progress. So we really want that pattern. Because did any of you guys like fully learn the pattern of goal setting already in your youth? Mm -hmm. That you could just, it's like without thinking, like you know what your plan is for your life? No? I didn't either. But it makes things so much better, right? Okay, organize classes and events with others, seeking to live purposefully and all learning to be a better community. That's so fun. I love the stories from Shauna's class. Like, to see the teachers like jump into the office at the end of the day and say, guess what happened? Like these kids bonded, they got it, they were serving each other and just oh, so excited. Like that's one of the main goals here is these kids are learning how to interact with each other. And I love when moms come and they say, all the kids are smiley. Like that's weird. I'm like, if they didn't, that would be weird, right? If that brand new student that has zero connections in the classroom doesn't immediately feel a part of things and feel welcomed, that would be a really weird day for us because these kids just have that culture of it's about more than acceptance. It's about serving each other. And then leadership is taught, modeled, and practiced to establish the skills and wisdom necessary to produce leaders. I have this really selfish goal that I want the world to be a better place, right? So if we can help our youth and their parents and their friends and any teachers that feel drawn to us, if we can help everybody kind of raise up that level of ownership over their lives and learn the principles it takes to really be successful, successful have impact and have good influence. I don't see how that's a bad thing, right? So it's good. All right, so first off, one main thing that's different about us, this is a little slideshow from someone else talking about traditional discipline. Um, once again, no judgment. I think we can all point to things that we've done, things we've fallen towards, things we've experienced, things that have happened to us that are more traditional discipline. But that whole culture of traditional discipline it leads down one path. And we all complain about the results of that path, right? We complain about, you know, not having ownership and, you know, lack of focus and lack of desire, you know, lack of caring about others, like, you know, feeling stuck, like all of those things, those are just fruit from this path of traditional discipline. And it's fun because there really is an alternative. These are just some of the principles that have made a huge difference in our classrooms, to be able to know that if we want to teach a child, let's see, for example, responsibility. If you want to teach somebody responsibility, first off, you have the power as the adult to be able to have a specific intention with what you're doing, right? Because we can't change somebody else, but we can change us. And then you have a skill that you can get better at, which is using appropriate consequences, right? And then the value that is learned by the person you're influencing is responsibility. And so it's this wonderful shift of we as adults, and we're teaching that to the children, that they have the power over their attitude. They have the power over the way that they interact with others and their intention behind what they're saying and all of that. That's where their power lies, right? We don't want to give that away. But then there's skills that they can learn to be able to resolve conflict better and communicate better be able to think through problems, and when they're frustrated, be able to change how they attack that with the understanding that they have the power to learn and do better, that failure is not a permanent thing, right? So this is a little bit about the culture. If anybody needs this resource, Easy to Love, Difficult to Discipline by Becky Bailey is an awesome book that gives you, like, step by step. She goes through all of these. And this is the other part, is in this path to really find what are those principles of culture that we really need to have as part of what we're doing. We really found that there's a lot of false traditions that we believe we have to do things a certain way or we think this is just the way it is, right? This is the way it's always been, right? Isn't that the lie that we hear all the time? We just have to do it that way. Like, you're not allowed to talk about, you know, whatever. Like, I, one of mine was you weren't allowed to talk about faith and academics at the same time. I've learned. Because it's so amazing, and it doesn't have to be church. It doesn't have to be doctrine. It can absolutely 100% just be, like, I have faith, and I know that I'm here for a reason. So there's obviously a reason why this is important, and even a reason why I'm good at it. And now I can be able to put my passion into that, knowing that there's connection and reasons for the things we do. So these are some of our um, principles that we're founded on. And so if anyone wants to come and be a part of what we're doing, Whatever faith background, culture, patterns that they're coming from, awesome. 
like we're so excited the kids finally have a place and we as adults finally have a place to love each other and support each other and we don't have to like have a checklist to get in the door right we just have to agree that we each have divine worth right there's more than just the day-to-day -day work that we could do and we're you know each individual is very important and that parents have a really important bond. So this book on that side, for you guys, it's right side. Hold on to your kids. This is a really amazing resource. Um, Katie put on the website some little videos from Gordon Neufeld, some, some great resources. But if you just want to dive in, this book really opens up the vault of why parenting is harder now than it was generations ago. And it doesn't need to be, but we need to absolutely change the tide for our own way that we function with that stewardship and that perspective on those are your kids, right? So what it does for teachers is it takes the burden off. The teachers here at AFE are not going to be the parents for your kids. They're not. So how awesome that they get to just bring their passion and excitement and their expertise and they can love on these kids, but they're connected to you as parents and bringing that influence in and these kids know that they're just an extension of what you want for them. They're not looking to those parents say, or those teachers saying, please raise me and tell me different than what my parents would do because I want to separate. <sighs> so anyways, so that's really, really important. Um, if we ever have a teacher that would ever possibly ever come in and say, awesome, but I know better than the parents and so I'm going to do it this way even though they want something different, it's not a good fit. We really feel strongly about developing the heart, might, mind, and strength to be able to have that holistic perspective. And we go into depth in what each of those mean. But it's just so amazing to be able to feel like we're growing by being here and they're growing, but they're growing balanced, right? Sometimes I don't like the word balanced, but in this sense, we really want these kids to feel balanced because there's too many times that we're in environments that care a lot more about maybe our strength or maybe our IQ, our mind, but it, that environment doesn't really want our heart you know, and our integrity be part of it. They just want us to leverage like the knowledge we could possibly retain, right? That's not balanced. All right, and then true maturity. Hold on to your kids is a really great resource for this. But one thing that we've, we've seen it happen, I've seen it happen in my own home and this book really explains what's happening. True maturity means you get a chance to build a solid foundation that, to stand on. How many of us as adults have had moments where we're like, I feel like I'm 18 again? Mm -hmm because I'm a little bit off balance because I didn't quite get my feet solidly planted in that aspect of who I am and what I want out of life. Has anybody felt that besides me? <laughs> okay, good. It's not just me. Awesome. So with our children, sometimes at the beginning it looks like, well, why are, why are the parents connecting so much? I mean, this child's already 15. Why is that mom like really dialed in and focused on who they are as a person? and connecting and bonding with them. Why are we doing that? Like they're almost done, they're super close, they just need to man up and be more mature. But we've all experienced that, right? We've all experienced that like, now I'm in my 30s, 40s, and I, I'm not quite sure what to do in this moment, right? So instead, if we can really help nurture them in every aspect of who they are, give them a really solid foundation, they grow into this natural maturity where it's not that they're getting away from us, that they're honoring their parents. And they're honoring that possibly by doing something that nobody in their family has ever done before, but they know where they came from. And they can bring the things they've learned with them and be able to go and extend the reach of that family influence out in the world. So um, we're going to have our new local director, one of them. Alec is going to come up and read um, a little selection from Teaching in the Savior's Way. This was a pamphlet that came out and somebody sent it to me of this is what you're doing. And I love that. I love those resources. So if you find things that you think are either better than what we're doing or aligned with what we're doing, we actually grab them up and we put them here. So when people come and say, why in the world are you not doing traditional discipline? Say, it's, it's great. Like, you don't have to study the way I do it. How about you go to like some of the amazing resources that we've gone to, right, that have helped hundreds and thousands of people. And then if you feel like it's right for your family, awesome. That's cool. So this is one of those where it was an amazing resource, but we've kind of been on that front edge of we're doing things in a way that's not the way they've been done for the last few decades or so. And so sometimes we get those comments of, well, if you just did it like this, everyone's doing it like that, that would be recognizable. 
right? That would, like if you would just give them grades, then we could compare them to other, you know, like they, j people, it's that, it's natural to want to have things that are comfortable, right, or familiar. So we've been like breaking as many of those things as humanly possible <laughs> for our good, right, to make them better. But it's really fun to be able to push into that space of, we want these kids to learn how to discuss and to feel safe and loved. And the role of a teacher and the example that teacher sets, like all of this stuff, it's really different. So the teachers here, they work really hard, but we get together and it's like, it's not even been 24 hours and we miss each other. And you know, the kids are taking turns hugging all the teachers because they're coming back and the teachers are excited. The idea is that we, we were already being recognized for doing something different that wasn't being done. It wasn't even being done in like some church classrooms. And then all of a sudden this resource came out to help a specific church be able to help their teachers change the culture in those classrooms. And it's like, well, this could just be our teaching manual. This could be the culture of how we do this and how we interact and the purpose of the teacher in that classroom with those kids to help them recognize their own worth and what they're capable of. So Alex is going to read the introduction to that for us and then we'll move on. When you think about the Savior's way of teaching, what comes to mind? Can you see him teaching the multitudes by the sea, speaking privately with the woman at the well, or blessing a little child? As you read about him in the scriptures, what do you notice about his way of helping others learn and grow? What does teaching in the Savior's way mean to you? The Savior's way of teaching. Jesus Christ declared, I am the way. As you ponder his life and your own opportunities to teach, you will find that the way to become an effective teacher is to become more like the Savior. The Savior's way of teaching came from who he was and the power of the Spirit that he carried with him. The key to teaching as the Savior taught is to live as the Savior lived. And how did he live? The Savior was full of love. Whether he was encouraging a penitent sinner, tutoring his disciples, or rebuking the Pharisees, everything the Savior did was an expression of love. This love and compassion for people and their needs led him to teach in ways that were meaningful to them. When the Savior taught familiar, real-life experiences like fishing, childbirth, and herding sheep, they became spiritual lessons. The Savior sought and obeyed his Father's will and taught his Father's doctrine. From his childhood, Jesus was about his Father's business, seeking to do always those things that please him. My doctrine is not mine, he said, but his that sent me. The Savior was completely committed to his sacred mission, to bring God's children back to him. So Jesus did more than just impart information. He gave his followers important responsibilities that strengthened their faith and helped them grow. He trusted them, prepared them, and sent them into all the world to teach, bless, and serve others. The Savior loved the scriptures and used them to teach and testify of his mission. He taught people to search the scriptures to find their own answers to questions. As he taught the word of God with power, people came to know truth for themselves. The Savior lived what he taught. In every setting, he was the perfect example. He taught his followers to pray by praying with them. He taught them to, he taught them to love and serve by the way he loved and served them. He taught them how to live his gospel by the way he lived. He was always teaching, often in formal settings, but just as often in homes and in personal informal conversations. There is so much more for you to discover about the Savior's way of teaching, but this much is certain. Power to truly teach in his way will come as you learn of him and follow him. There's a culture behind everything that we're doing. So when we talk about dress codes, there should never be any person that walks through that door and feels judged and feels like they need to leave, ever, right? Like. I could like pound my fist like a big scary Catherine like never should anyone ever walk in that door and feel like I'm not comfortable I have to go because I'm being judged we have high goals we have goals for these kids to feel like they're these powerful future leaders they have all this important future to be preparing for that they are being treated like adults while they're here as much as humanly possible right and we will like push the envelope of we'll teach the, we'll treat them more like an adult and then we'll have them and we're like okay 
so you're not ready for that yet, so we're going to do this, but you know I want to be able to allow, right? And so these kids are being shown what it looks like to be treated the way that we really should be treating each other. And when they see us come as staff and leaders that we're not dressing like we're going to the store or we're going to go paint a house, like we're dressing like this is important, right? We're helping raise these kids up and we're interacting with each other that, you know, we are the leaders right now, right? The adults in here. So we want to really display that. So the staff has that goal to come really, coming where you don't have to ask or kind of see how we behave. Like we know our day is going to be really important, right? Unless you're doing something like gardening, right? Jiu-jitsu, jiu -jitsu, all those different things like dressing appropriately for the activities. But when we're coming and we're really presenting to these children, we really want them to see and feel that feeling. And we want these kids to feel comfortable dressing into the truth of how important they are. And I love that we've had the situation where we've had kids come in a suit on a regular basis. They'll come and say, you know what, I feel like, like we had one student, he got elected to be the president of the scholar group. That entire two months, he wore a suit every day <laughs> because he, knew, he wanted all the kids to know that like if they needed something, he was there for them. He was the one that they could ask and that he needed to be a little bit more tight in how he welcomed the kids to class and in the way he behaved during class time. It's not a judgment thing, but we really are aiming for that. And so a lot of times we get parents saying, can you make it easier for us? And we'll blame it on you that you're forcing us to buy you a uniform. Is that going to work, do you think? No. Um, no. I can help with other resources if you need help having more influence with your children. But we're not going to force you to do anything, and we're not going to force them to do anything, especially by making them feel bad or worthless, right? And so we really just want to help. But there's also really um, wonderful skills when you're in a leadership program to be able to communicate and influence for better. So if you ever have something where you're saying, I really want to inspire my child to stop eating candy for lunch or something, like we can totally help with that, right? Because we've inspired a lot of change in a lot of people for a long time. <laughs> but it's having an excuse where there's force isn't sustainable. And that doesn't inspire a heart change. So cool. OK, any questions on that? We're all good? We can move on? Awesome. There are kids that come in shorts, but they come looking like they're ready for their day. It's not about the specifics. It's really about, OK, you're going somewhere really important. And you have all this awesome stuff you're going to do today. And this is somewhere special you're going into. You know, how, how do you want to dress today, right? And just helping them recognize that how you dress really affects how you feel. Cell phone policy, who has a cell phone? Who has been distracted by a cell phone? Fantastic. Um, who has kids with a cell phone? Begrudgingly, seriously, like if I could put my hand down, I would. Um, a lot of our kids have cell phones. We are not going to be the police that change a pattern in your home, right? Is that fair to say it like that? Like, we won't fix that for you, but if you want to fix that and help there be a different culture of what the phone is for, we can absolutely support and edify that. But we also cannot allow for a lot of the things that come with that in the classrooms. And so we're kind of like, like I said before, we're that allow, treat you like an adult first, and then if there's an issue, and this is with the clothing thing too. If there's a student, one time we had a student, her pants did not fit. And it wasn't about she was being immodest. It was about she was really uncomfortable and she couldn't close her pants because they just didn't fit her. We didn't go and talk to her and say, you really need to buy different pants because you've gained weight or you've grown. Like, we wouldn't do that. But we had that teacher that had the connection to the parents say, I don't know if you're aware, but she's really struggling. You know, is there a way we can help? So that's why the parent and teachers are super bonded because if there's an issue like with a cell phone where it's a distraction, we're going to... Problem solve that really quick of like, okay, right now this is what we're doing. But really, the more permanent solutions or the more <coughs> specific focus is going to be decided between teachers and parents, not between a negotiation of that child and teacher trying to figure out what to do. So please be connected to your teachers. Attendance policy, we're a private school. We are not, we don't get paid because you showed up by some big government organization, right? Like that. Our goal is to be available to you to serve what it is you're looking for from us and to give you more than what you were expecting, to love on your kids more and love on you more as a person than you thought was possible in a school environment. That's our goal. Um, if you choose to say, you know what, I changed my mind last minute and I'm not going to be here today. We're going to do something else today. 
it's not our stewardship to judge that. Like, you can choose that. But you're investing in your child's education, and these teachers are planning a month block at a time. And so whenever you first register, you're going to say, these are the months that I know I really want my child to participate in programs here. You might be the kind of mom that says, I want to participate and set a pattern once a quarter. You might say, I just want one semester, and then we're going to go to Europe. Like, whatever you want to do, you set that intention of, this is what I want. This is what we're doing. And then if you change last minute, cool, but the teacher is specifically planning for each individual child that they know is coming for that three-week block. And so if you're not there, that teacher planned for that child, it wouldn't be fair to say, well, I didn't end up showing up, so you know, I don't want to help support that teacher, right? Like we really want to help the teachers be able to share their gifts and be able to be here. So that's why we do that. When you do your little interview, this is kind of one of the final steps, is setting your intentions of what you're really looking for. And even what schedule and what electives you want go in the boxes on the top, because that helps us. We kind of have every elective I could ever think of available to us. It's just a matter of, well, what do the parents want? Right? Because we don't sign the kids up for electives. You decide whether or not you even want them to do anything extra. So if you have things that you want, I can almost guarantee you there's going to be somebody who really would love to teach that. If there's enough children that want to do that, it's going to be awesome.